feeling constrained and constricted and tied to things and objects and perceptions and assumptions. You just, you're not in a position to love. You're not in a position to serve. You're not in a position to see yourself as the group entity. And you're not feeling your freedom and you're not in a position to feel confident or so when you're in a constricted state <clears throat> and you see somebody that's not, then obviously you're going to, your projections are going to come up also because everybody wants, you, not everybody, but like the sort of the natural masculine wants to be the leader of some kind, wants to be powerful, authentic, um, precise, intelligent leader, um, trusted by his peers and the people around him and so forth. And you all know that potential instinctively. So if you're in a constricted state and you're looking at someone who's not in a constricted state, then you're going to, that's going to be a teacher in that sense. It's going to be teaching reflection. And your insecurities are going to come up because they now have an object to latch onto. But it's, if you can transmute that, which is what you're doing, then you can become that which you want to become, which you instinctively know is within your potential. But freedom is a requirement, in my experience anyway. I wouldn't be able to be fearless if I didn't know my freedom. And I wouldn't be able to be powerful and attractive and trusted if I didn't know my freedom. So. The dark path takes care of a lot of the relative things. Especially if you don't dismiss the relative things. But if your main focus is the direct path for your own development, then you're just going to accelerate that whole burning up process, leaving nothing but the authentic, powerful, true self. But just look at your relative lives and see how often you can track because you fear consequences. Like, is there any other reason? If you did not believe consequences existed, if you did not believe unsafety existed, then would there ever be a reason to not be 100% clear and authentic and free and express yourself however you feel like expressing yourself naturally. It's always because you draw in a consequence that you're giving inherent existence, you project it as inherent existence. So this very simple exercise of getting real direct with your the purity of your experience, where you can go back and forth between the apparent experience between I'm drinking glass out of a water, I'm drinking water out of glass, hopefully, That wouldn't be as pleasant, <laughs> nor easy to hold. I have to think about this. It's that simple. If I don't think while I drink, I'm not experiencing drinking glass of water. <laughs> like I said, it's not flawless, but <laughs> it's, when it matters, it's flawless. Um, so if you make that distinction very clear viscerally, like you want to get to a visceral point, just again, like the dancing analogy, right? You can feel when you're dancing, whether you're self-conscious or not self-conscious, nothing wrong with being self-conscious, but you can <laughs> you just notice the difference. You're either dancing because the flow is there and like, you're just like, you could say I'm in my own world, but it's more expensive than that. It's very connected. And then you're like, oh, how am I moving in the eyes of others? And like, well, you, that is such a black and white night and day distinction, physically, you feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind, you feel it in your consciousness. So, but the same thing applies. In order to have the illusion that you're experiencing a table, in order to believe that, you need to believe it. So you need to exit the I am. Again, you don't technically exit the I am, but it seems like that. You can feel it that way. I'm I'm leaving my I amness in order to believe that I'm experiencing a table. But if I look at it directly, it disappears. It's not my direct experience. 
And it's not about coming to any extreme statement, like there is no table, although you could say that too, but it's just about being really honest with what's direct experience and what's completely inferred and make believe and assume. Because that's the way to become purer is to become more closely aligned to what's truly happening. What's truly the case, what truly is. And in my isness, in my presence, I don't experience a table. I experience myself, my beingness, which arguably is not yet yourself, but we could call it the self. It's closer than my projections. If you can develop a sense for that, you can apply to any scenario when you feel uncomfortable in group settings, when you're public speaking, and you just kind of like zone out the whole world and you become aware of this, like, oh, there might be 500 people looking at me right now, but I don't know that's the case. That's not my experience. I have to think, I have to lose myself in the thought to create that reality for myself experientially, energetically. So I can stay clear from that too. I cannot project that 500 people are listening to me and just tune into my own presence and let the flow do what it does. And the closer I stay to myself, the more effortless my expression will be. And the more you'll notice that you're not actually talking. It's kind of the next level of that is you realize you're not talking because you're witnessing the talking. The talking too, to speak what it, whatever you call your authentic expression is not actually your authentic expression. It's just a unique blurb of creation that happens to come out of you. Nothing personal about it, ultimately. I'm not saying it's not beautiful or preferred over inauthentic expressing, but when you really open it up, you're not even attached to your authentic expression because that too is part and parcel of the field as it happens. And if you stay really, really close, you just feel all you know is your freedom. So then whatever comes, comes. Whatever expresses itself, expresses itself. And you're not identified with what you're expressing. Because, you know, we can create this other kind of contraction around having to be authentic. And sometimes you do that a little bit, Kiki, like automatically. Um, like you've placed some value on authentic authenticity, which I agree with on a relative level. But like you can take that even farther where you see like, oh, I'm actually creating some constriction around the idea of having to be authentic. What if you don't have to be authentic? Who told you? Who cares if you're authentic or not? <laughs> you know, If you have that freedom, then what naturally comes, we call that authentic. Why? Be only The only reason we call it authentic is not because it belongs more to you than the fake stuff. The fake stuff belongs just as much or just as little to you as the real stuff belongs to you or not to you. We call it authentic because the energy that comes when it expresses itself doesn't feel constricted, doesn't feel manipulative, doesn't feel like it has an ulterior motive, doesn't feel like there's self-consciousness with it. So we call it authentic, but this is just another label in the spiritual world. But if you look at it directly, that's also not yours. That's also assumed, that's also a construct. And that relieves you of a lot of pressure. Like imagine not having to be authentic anymore. That's great. <laughs> As a result, you'll be more authentic. I don't know. But so you want to pick apart as many of these constructs that you can notice. So the combination is just scanning your field of experience, like mindfulness. But bring that to a subtle level. So not just mindfulness in terms of like, oh, my body is sitting on the couch and I'm feeling my feet walking on the floor and I'm feeling my breath, that's a very surface level mindfulness. That's good beginning to train a little bit of that scanning ability. But then you want to take it subtler. What am I assuming right now? What am I sensing? What am I believing? You want to take it to the level of beliefs, constructs. And as you apply that mindfulness to that level of subtlety, with the background discernment or wisdom, of what's me versus what's not me, what's self, what's not self, what's real, what's not real. If you combine that mindfulness at a subtle level with that wisdom quality of discernment or neti neti, it's a very powerful combination. 
It's a very rapid purification process that way and liberating process as a result. <laughs>